Uh, hello, I'm one of the cool kids, Rahul Astapa. Welcome to a fantastic Rahul Astapa with the lovely Les Dennis. You're going to really enjoy this one. Uh, I'm on stage at the Leeds City Varieties right now. It's a beautiful venue uh, and it's one of the many venues I'll be coming to on my tour, which is going on all of 2019 and probably into 2020. Gigs that are coming up include Wakefield, uh, where Kay Meller, the fantastic writer, is going to be one of my guests. We've got King's Place in London with Russell Howard on the 10th of June and hopefully Michael Sheen on the 17th of June. We have got, what else have we got? We're going to the Warwick Art Centre, we're going to Canterbury, we're going to maybe to York uh, in July uh, and then there's loads more coming up. The Edinburgh Fringe 2nd to the 25th of August at the Newtown Theatre at 1.30pm every day except Monday. There's going to be loads of uh, lovely podcasts coming out for you at home if you can't come and see those but they'll be audio only, the Edinburgh ones. Go to rahalaspa.co.uk for more information about this podcast. Go to richchang.com slash gigs for more information about the tour. Now, let's listen to wonderful Les Dennis and him, his fantastic stories of the olden days. <laughs> it's Rahul Astapa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. You're already much better than last week's audience. Will you please welcome a man who has literally just made up this introduction right now. That's how amazing the ad libby is. It's Richard Herring. <laughs> Hello, lovely to see you. Welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. It's nice to have you back. Uh, some of you were here last week. Uh, right, not, not this guy with the plaster on his finger. I don't know what happened. I don't know where he came from. So, uh, we do a lot of banter before the actual show that the people at home must go, oh, I wish I was here. You can, you could come down and see the shows. They're great. Go to richherring.com slash gigs. Ha ha! Bad luck, people who skip through the intro. Ha ha ha! Oh, you just get through this bit as well. Anyway, welcome. Welcome. I'll have to do it when uh, the guest is on. Welcome to uh, a podcast called Richard Herring's Lobbing Small Snail Tentacles podcast. <laughs> You'd think I would be, I'd, uh, wouldn't be running out of ideas so fast. It's a, it's a podcast where you just, the guest, we take the tentacles off snails and then see who can throw them the furthest. It's just a new idea. It's a very crowded mar market, the podcast market. No one else is doing that. But I was playing badminton with some of the kids uh, who had notes from the doctor saying they didn't have to do proper games. And uh, <laughs> they call it Rehalastipus. I, I don't know if that's going to catch on. Um, so good. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to do, I haven't really thought of th what this routine is going to be. And I'm kind of slightly worried about it because my wife listens to this show. But I, I saw a guy saying he was a happily married man, right? And I kind of thought that's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Because you never hear anyone say, you know, I'm, you know it was all right. <laughs> So it's, you don't need to say I'm a happily married man. You either, no one, you, when you're married, even if you're not happy, you don't say. And even if you're unhappy, you still say you're happily married. I think more if you're unhappy, you say I'm a happily married person. There's no need. I'm a married person. It's, it has its ups and downs. That, that is, that's the truth. It's, I'm a quite happily married. So if anyone says that I'm a happily married man or woman, be suspicious of them. I'm a very happily married man, though, if my wife's listening. <laughs> She knows the truth. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's talk, let's have a little chat. We'll have a quick chat with the, the audience before we bring. We've got a fantastic guest this week. I don't want to waste my time. I'm just trying to look for a new, look at this guy. Now he is. The, you are one of the cool kids. He's got one of those uh, those earrings that's like a big round plastic thing that goes through. That is that. I should. You're going to be in the next week's intro, mate. So uh, what's what's your name? Carl, that's a cool name, isn't it? and he's got a he's got a partner. He's holding hands with. It's very exciting. How, what do you do for a living, Carl? I work at a castle. You work at a castle. <laughs> <laughs> Which castle is it? It's called Hersman Zoo Castle. Hersman Zoo Castle. <laughs> Hersman Zoo Castle. Hersman Zoo Castle. Is that in the UK? It's in Sussex. It's in Sussex. What kind of stuffs in the castle? <laughs> 
Not a lot. What do what, what what do you what's your job there? Are you a soldier? I work on the estate. You work on the estate. You're kind of doing gardening and stuff. Well, Cutting down trees. You do the outside the what? I work outside the garden. You work outside the gardens. What? Staring in at the gardens. <laughs> <laughs> Going one day. Is there a maze you have to get through to get in there? Is that the problem? <laughs> You're building a maze next year. Is that your job? That's very exciting. And uh, who's this charming young lady you're with? This is my girlfriend. Your girlfriend. Ooh. Ma- very. Good. You're quite new to each other because you seem like you're holding hands and stuff. As <laughs> you quite. How long you been together? Jen, how long you been together, Jenny? Since June. Since June. That's ages. What is going on with you two? Uh, so that's <laughs> weird, isn't it? Have you had sex yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. 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 Twice. Good <laughs> work, mate. Good luck. Don't, don't get married. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's... No, if you get married, don't have kids. Have you got kids? You've got kids? Yeah. You've got five grandchildren? Wow, good work. Good work. Good work, Jenny. But in every sense. I mean, there's obviously some terrible story where you got pregnant when you were 11. It's fine, it's good. That's good, it's still good. It's still good. And that's allowed in Sussex anyway. So it's... Well, well, well done to you both. <laughs> I think, can we just bump the guests and we'll just talk to these... What gold. So, look, I'm very, very excited uh, about this guest this week. I've been trying to get him on for a long time because, like me, you will know him best from his appearance as an audience member at the British Soap Awards in 2014. That is... But he's also known for hosting quite a famous game show, The Grid. Uh, I don't know if you remember that from... from Channel 5. We all love The Grid. Will you please welcome Les Dennis, ladies and gentlemen, it's Les Dennis! <laughs> Les Dennis. Thank you. How you doing, Les? I'm good. What are all these people doing in your, your front room? <laughs> in the grid, it was called. In the grid? In the grid. Oh, yeah. of course it was. That and makes it was sense fascinating. Now. What happened in In the Grid? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> we did we did four a day for quite a long oh, time. It's like that, isn't it? It was it was uh, it was a was it channel it was Channel Five channel show. Channel Five, I think yeah, so. It was Channel Five show, and um, it was up against It Takes Two, so it didn't have much of a chance <laughs> on it. Because you don't put the I think they learned that those kind of game shows now you put into the five o'clock slot, slot not the um, oh yes yeah six thirty slot. Okay. But uh, Richard Osman produced it. So Did he? There, there you go. I must yeah. get him back on to talk about it. Cause... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, it's fantastic. There's so much that we could talk about, uh, Les. And uh, let's start with my goodness. This is what I want to know about you. Yeah. Now in Norwich, <laughs> the name Les Dennis has been spray painted <laughs> over many, many walls in huge capital letters. Yeah. <laughs> Who did that, Les? And well, it's, time, it's time for you. It's, it's funny because like, I saw it on Twitter and I'd seen it a few times and I thought, somebody's just kind of put it together, you know, what do you call it, CGI? What, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that thing. So, um, I, it's, it's definitely CGI. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call it? You know. spray, spray paint? No, when you, <laughs> when you put it on, make yeah. it... Photoshop. 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 That's Photoshop, a word. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I didn't know. I, I couldn't think of it either. Senior moment there. But um, basically, so I thought it was, And then somebody said, no, it's for real. So I, I then t- uh, tweeted saying, I didn't do it, you know, which made me sound like Shaggy. <laughs> it wasn't me. So, um, and, uh, and it kind of then went viral. And yeah. I think uh, uh, Norwich um, local news... Um, picked it up <laughs> yeah. and ran with it um, and then it just seemed to, to become I think it ended up on Have I Got News For You they, they discussed it as well but you know obviously somebody uh, some artist Wanksy <laughs> maybe <laughs> are the Les Dennis <laughs> are the Les Dennis is worth anything if people are they people putting them behind <laughs> Perspex well apparently <laughs> in now in another town it's Bobby Davro oh, they moved on to Bobby Davro <laughs> <laughs> 
So it's kind of maybe it's a post-impressionist yeah, thing. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> we don't allow jokes on this show. <laughs> we do not approve of jokes. But somebody as well told me that there's one in uh, London because I did a play at the Finsbury Park last year, yeah. and um, and the manager there said, "Look, there's this one uh, outside our." It's a, it's a youth craze. It's a, cra it's a new craze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kids going around writing your name on walls <laughs> leads to worse things. If it leads to Bobby Davro. That yeah. is, <laughs> that's not <laughs> something anyone wants. So, look, I mean, you've been in the business for a very long time. A long time, yeah. Um, yeah. Like you started as a 17-year-old, or were you even younger yeah, than that? Yeah, 1971, I did my first telly which was Opportunity Knocks, right. the old, you know, the talent show with when Huey Green was hosting it before Bob Monkhouse, people might, I should imagine, does anybody remember Huey Green? Yeah. With the, yeah, the Huey Green, he was, he was the um, presenter of Opportunity Knocks. But talking about the kind of the talent show in the days when um, you didn't vote by phone, you had to send a postcard in. <laughs> <laughs> you had to write down who you thought your top three were. Yeah. And then um, that would, that by, on the Friday, then the producer would ring you up and say, sorry, Les, like they, did, they rang me and said, sorry, Les, you came fourth. Oh. Which I think they probably said to everybody who came either fourth, fifth or sixth, yeah. you know, because they only announced the top three. Sure. So um, that was my first telly. Right. Yeah. And so you were doing the clubs in Liverpool with your mum taking you around? I was doing the working men's clubs, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's an incredible circuit. I was still circuit. at school. I was still at yeah. school, yeah. yeah. I, you were on, I saw your This Is Your Life you did in the, yeah. in the 90s, and yeah. one of your teachers was there and said you wouldn't go into a rehearsal to a play and he let you go because you were earning more than he was in a year for, <laughs> your, for your one night of doing this stand-up. Yeah, right? well, you know, kind of, it was funny because I was at school with an amazing group of people. I was at, at school with Clyde Barker, the horror writer. Right. Um, and Jude Kelly, who went on to run West Yorkshire Playhouse. Yes. And then uh, the uh, South Bank. Um, and Steve Koppel, the footballer, and, you know, kind of like... So it was a real um, kind of hotbed of, of football and um, the arts. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I didn't know whether I was going to go down the drama route and become an actor or go down the working men's clubs route. And I'd, my mum knew uh, somebody she worked with. She worked at Lucas's um, Aerospace. Uh, factory and um, a mate of hers said, "I'll give Les uh, his expenses uh, to do ten minutes um, between the two acts right. on, um, uh, on on a Saturday night." And one of the acts was a, a local comic called um, Jackie Hamilton, who I later did a play about right. uh, Jackie Hamilton. Jackie, I, I did a show which were, I think was probably in Edinburgh when you were there, called Jigsy. Yes. Which was a one-man play about this, this um, comedian, Jackie Hamilton. So I had to go on um, after him. And he was a legend in Liverpool. He's one of those kind of, like, comics that never got out of his own... Um, he was very parochial. He never got outside of Liverpool. I think he did the comedians once. But he was, like, just a funny, funny man. You know, he had funny bones. Um, like, he was, on, he was an extra on Tenko. Right. Um, which, uh, if you remember, anybody who remembers it, it was a, a, a drama. Uh, Stephanie Cole, I think, was in it, um, uh, and uh, Stephanie Beecham. I think so, um, yeah, and right. it was uh, set in a Japanese uh, prisoner of war camp. And Jackie Hamilton was one of the extras in it. And in the afternoon, the director was kind of like arranging everybody for a scene, and he went, Hang on a minute, I can't have you. Look at you, you've got a, a beer belly, <laughs> you've got a, a boozy nose, you stink of whiskey, you, you can't be a prisoner of war. And Jackie said, I was only captured yesterday. <laughs> 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 Which is just great, isn't it? So they kept him and they put him at the back. But, but he kind of like, he used to do like, he'd, he'd stand there and say, you know, you, you, look at that. Pint of mile. You can't get a decent pint of mile these days, except in the wine, in the wine lodges. Um, me, and, me and Arnie and uh, Dick the Docker uh, and Archie were all down at uh, the wine lodge the other night. And uh, Archie said, you're not looking your usual cheerful self. I said, well, I've got to have a vasectomy, haven't I? He said, well, you haven't got to. I said, I have. She said that she's going to divorce me if I don't have one. He said, well, have you tried talking to her about it? He said, well, yeah, we've been arguing about it for weeks. The other night, I went out for a pint, and her and the kids had a, a vote as to whether I should have one or not. <laughs> and I lost 13, 12. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 
he did he did the wife jokes, but he yeah. didn't do them in he did them in a kind of really loving sure. way. It wasn't kind of like a he, he was he was an old fashioned brilliant stand up who you know didn't didn't survive. But so I went on. Sorry, I went on and did me ten minutes uh, for the the concert secretary that my mum knew. And um, I was working, uh, I had a Saturday job um, in a, a do-it-yourself shop where I was working all day, lugging tiles up and down the stairs, uh, and I got a pound for my wages for, for the one day in, on a Saturday. And uh, I, I came off, and, um, and uh, the guy said, well, there you go, Jackie Hamilton, he's already well established on the show, and there's that young lad starting on the first rung of the ladder. I always remember that, thinking, all oh, right, I'm on the first rung of the ladder. So I came off, and he came up to me and said, here's your expenses, and he gave me two quid. Right. So I thought, two quid for 10 minutes? <laughs> this works. So um, that's when I started doing the working men's clubs and, and loved it, you know. But it was it tough, because they were quite yeah. rough, rough. Yeah, Bugs yeah, and, you know, kind of like, um, I, at first, they were kind of like, oh, he's only young, you know. I mean, sometimes, um, you, you know, you'd get to the door of the working men's club and it was that kind of like cl cloth cap and the kind of like, you're not coming in, um, I'm the comic, you're, you're not coming in unless you pay your two, your, your two shillings right. to get in. But I'm the comedian, no, you're not, not your age. <laughs> you're not the kid. So I had to pay two shillings to get in, go in, do the, the, the job. And, uh, you know, sometimes, oh, he's a young lad and he's doing impressions. But then, you know, once you started doing the circuit, it was like, no, you know, we're paying him money for this. And like I had a, a concert chairman who said that he had to lock himself in his, in his, in his uh, room, in his office for the complaints. <laughs> uh, and another time I remember um, on a stage like this, kind of like you always dreaded if you couldn't get out of the, the, the dressing room at the back, if you couldn't go out that way. Way. Because if you didn't do well, if you died, you would have to walk across the stage and, you know, walk through them while they're playing bingo. And me and my dad had to walk through. My dad carrying me props. My dad used to get embarrassed about it and done well. <laughs> he loved, you know, what I did, but he, he, he was just a very sensitive man. So we're walking across. And as we're walking down, this guy, we're in Preston, and this guy called me over. He said, they were terrible. And I thought, I went, thank God somebody who knows that it wasn't me, it was the audience. And I said, they were, weren't they? They were terrible. He went, no, not they. They were terrible. <laughs> After, you know, I had, I had curtains closed on me. I had, to, you know, a concert chairman saying, come off, bonnie lad, don't punish yourself. <laughs> And I, and I came off and he said, well, you know, like, lads, I'm sorry, because I'd emptied the room. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a dart do. And I was going on, you know, it was all, all fellas. And within 10 minutes, I had emptied the room. I was doing Frank Spencer and all this. And I'm going, what the... And so um, I came off and I, he, he said, don't punish yourself. And I, as I was leaving, he said, well, you know, you've got to say, on telly, he's all right, but live, he's crap. <laughs> so, you know, I had all those, all those dates. And, you know, D Dustin G, I worked in a, in a double act with, with Dustin G. And, you know, I remember him once going on stage and just deciding, because if you, if you did badly in a, in a club, if you had two spots, after you'd done your first spot, you'd, they'd come off and you'd, the, the concert chairman would say, I'm paying you off which is meaning give, give you half your money. Right. Um, and so, but Dustin one night was on stage and he just looked at them and said, I'm paying you off. I'm pay you're a terrible audience, I'm gonna pay you off. So he kind of did that to the audience and then he said, I'm gonna get home tonight. He said, I live in Cemetery Road uh, in Swindon. I'm gonna walk upstairs open the curtains, look across and say, you think you bastards died? <laughs> so, he just, he was, he was a funny man. Yeah. He was, uh, now, I was watching some of the laughter show that's uh, on YouTube. Yeah. And, yeah, and he's, he's, I mean, you're both, it's, it's a very interesting show. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's so much to talk about. But, you know, because obviously this is 1986 as well. Yeah. So you, it's, yeah. it's quite a traditional show in yeah. lots of ways. Yeah. So there's lots of things that, resonate yeah. back with, uh, you know, there's there's a variety of stuff. There's yeah. sort of a hot gossipy dance yes. trip in it. Yeah. And there's a little barbershop quartet doing a sort of weird <laughs> thing about blowing out a candle. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but what's interesting, and, you know, there's some very light, light entertainment sort of trad yeah. stuff, but what's interesting is you're mixing it up even in the one or two I saw. Yeah. Uh, Dustin does a Peter Cook impression and yeah. it's quite, yeah. and it's quite, 
Peter Cook sort of yep. material. Yeah, he loved Peter Cook. Yeah, yeah and you're doing uh, you're doing a routine with Arthur Scargill and Derek Hatton. Yes, you know, which you wouldn't again <laughs> expect in the middle no, of a no. like show. And it's kind show. of like just these last few yeah. weeks it's been posted again. Yeah, like, like it's topical again, kind of. So it's but he's yeah. There's a real I and mean, both of you, you can see the talent there. But there's a, it's I mean it's obviously. Uh, he died very tragically young. Yeah. in his forties, was he? When he, when uh, he was forty-three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we met on the Russ Abbott show. Uh, we'd, we'd kind of briefly met on Who Do You Do, which was an impressionist show that Freddie Starr and Little and Large and loads, loads of impressionists were on. Um, and uh, and then we we worked on the Russ Abbott show. Uh, I remember kind of before we worked on that, um, I was I was I'd been booked to be on the show, the series, The Rasab Madhouse um, at LWT, London Weekend Television. And um, I didn't have anywhere to stay. And I had the same manager as Dustin. And he said, well, you know, call Dustin. And, you know, because I knew he rents a flat in London. So see what... It, so he, I called him and he, and he said, yeah, I'll come and see you at the Panto. And he came... I was in Panto with Russ that, that Christmas. And he came and he knocked on my dressing room door. Um, and this very tall, very good-looking... Um, very like he had a movie style look, you know, kind yeah. of very imposing guy. Um, stood there at the door with a bottle of Liebfrau milk <laughs> and said, um, "I come bearing gifts." And he really did, you know, because he came into my life. Um, I was a rookie comic. He was already a star. You know those kind of those acts that can um, establish themselves in the club world without any television. He was like that, you know, yeah. kind of like, like the, the Mike Hardings and, you know, and Ronnie Dukes and Ricky Lee were a big act that could, you know, fill clubs sure. without uh, any television exposure. And Dustin was that kind of act. And then when we got together in the Russ Abbott show and we, and we started doing the Vera Mavis, you know, that, that's, where, um, that's where it kind of, it just, then the producers gave us lots of sketches as Vera Mavis and then other things. It just um, kind of clicked and he was willing as somebody who'd already established himself, to become a double act with a with a, a rookie young comic, yeah, yeah, you know, which was you know so generous of him, yeah, amazingly generous. Yeah, it's it's well, it's an interesting time because uh, you know you've you've got. We were saying this backstage, but you've got you know you started in the early seventies, yeah. and it was you know I think you're on the comedians a couple of times with you, and I was that was I was on it once, one time, one time, yeah, and I was I still I think I, I, I was the youngest uh, comedian ever to go on it, yeah, and you know I remember being uh, yeah, I was I was eighteen, and I remember going to the recording Johnny Hamp saying, "Well, you're going on, you'll be on quite late because all the other." Uh, uh, Comics are going to go off and do their gig. Yeah. So, like, you know, I had to go on 10th, you know, after Bernard Manning. Yeah. I was 18. <laughs> after Bernard Manning, after uh, uh, Frank Carson, after they were all there. Ken Goodwin, um, did some names some of you will know and some of you won't know. Um, uh, lovely Jim Bowen. And, you know, so I had to go on right at the end of the night. And, nice. and you know, you're going, that joke's gone, that joke's gone, that joke. <laughs> but it didn't really, as it happened, I couldn't do any of those. Because I was 18, I was doing jokes about my mum and dad, yeah. and about my sister and my brother, you know. Yeah. So, um, and I got one joke on that show. So. Well, they're sort of ticking them off the jokes off a board at the. At the yeah, back, you go there. You, you go. There's the yeah. 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 So you just yeah. everyone's sort of doing the same yeah. material. Yeah. It's sort of because at the 80s, obviously, as a comedy fan, and I think what's interesting for me as a comedy fan, I was I was you know I remember watching the comedians. Yeah. I remember watching all the Russ Abbott stuff. Yeah. Uh, I remember loving Cannon and Ball like when I was right. you know seven or eight. And then, like, the young ones and all that sort of stuff hit yeah. as I became a teenager. Yeah. And, and you were working at the same time as the, the young ones doing yeah. quite a, a trad show that was... We had to keep our head down in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that was, was establishment. I remember one time going to... The BBC always had a, a light entertainment Christmas party. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and, you know, I, I went along and just, like, I was the only one I didn't know. You know, they're just, just kind of like looking and, and going, wow, you know, there's Ronnie Barker, the, you know, the two Ronnies and, and, and everybody from the establishment side, but also, you know, Rick and uh, French and Saunders yeah. and, and Ben Elton. And what was really interesting at the beginning of the evening, you know, kind of the wine and the food is all over here. But there was one side over here you know, kind of the, like the establishment side. And over here was the, as they were labelled, alternative yeah. side. So, but nobody talking until Barry Cryer, the Kofi Annan of comedy. <laughs> 
comes in the middle and just says, come on, guys. And then got, when, once we got, all got talking, we realized that kind of the war was more media-based than it was, you know. I mean, the, yeah, the, there, were, there were some, I would, I, I look back, there are some things that I look back and go, whoa, shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't, you know, the, there's, there's a, a couple of times, I think, in, um, in where I think we did an EastEnders sketch and, and Dustin blacked up. But, you know, in the 80s, we're talking, you know. Yeah. And, you know, with the knowledge of that, we, we wouldn't do that now, and I certainly wouldn't do that now. But, you know, it was a time where there were things that, you know, I, I would hopefully say that on the whole, we, we weren't uh, kind of non-PC, you know, but, but some people were. So, yeah, yeah. The, so our, our, um, the, 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 the main, mainstream comics got a bit of a bad name at that time, you know. But what's interesting, I think, when you look back at all that 70s stuff, I mean, I talked to the Goodies recently yeah. and Monty Python as well, they yeah. were all doing, yeah. they yeah. were all doing the same thing. So, yeah. and, you know, and... It went on longer than that as well, even though, the, even though the alternative stuff came along. But I think what's interesting is the way that some comedians didn't get over that wall. Yeah. Some of those comedians from the comedians yeah. couldn't work in the 80s or, or, or lost the star yeah. in the 80s. But you, you, know, you found your way through that. I think because you, know, you, weren't, doing, you weren't doing overtly horrible yeah. stuff in, right. in, any of, in any of your act. But also you, you, know, you, you, you weathered that to work out I well, think you've I'm, done this your whole career, haven't you? You've, you've managed I've, to... I kind of, I've, yeah, I, I think... Um, uh, well, I did The Addams Family a couple of years ago, and um, one of the pr most proud things, I think... I just loved it. The, in The Guardian, it said, in the long and strange career of Les Dennis, <laughs> he makes yet another left turn. <laughs> but I thought, well, you know, that's fine. I'll take that any but day, you know? To be able to work for 40 or 50 years yeah. in this business yeah. is insane, right? Yeah, you know, it it's is. so difficult. Yeah. To, and to stay at that level, yeah. uh, going up and down at that level, but, down, stay, but, yeah. but stay <laughs> at a high level all the way yeah. through yeah. Is, is extraordinary. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that, there's, there's something there. Yeah in you that makes that possible and yeah. that's and when you when you do look back at the whole thing i know there's obviously times you've been through where it's been more difficult yeah but when you have the the chance to look back at the whole thing it's absolutely incredible what you've achieved and the people you've worked with and the things you've done yeah and I mean, you know I, I, people say oh about tommy cooper and i say i worked with him and they were like what and i not only i worked with him when i was um i was 20 years old in liverpool um, and I did a week at the Shakespeare uh, Theatre Club with him, which was a, a kind of variety um, kind of theatre club where, you know, they had uh, a big star and then uh, a singer and a, and a young comic or whatever. And I was the young comic that week. And I remember on the Monday sitting there uh, in my dressing room thinking, right, I've got to go and do my band rehearsal. I wonder if I'll get to meet him, you know. And, um, and I was sitting in my dressing room and then this kind of weird bloke with the longest hair down here in a pair of Bermuda shorts, just walked into my room and went, Aya. <laughs> he said, I just thought I'd put this on. <laughs> I wanted to try something visual. <laughs> and he, he, I was like, okay. And he was just funny, you know, yeah. he, was just, he was funny. And, and, and just, just, the minute you just saw him, he was, he was funny. I mean, there's a lovely story about Tommy, like when um, he was in the guards, and he was on duty one night, and, um, and he was uh, standing on duty, and he was, he was falling asleep, and he's gone off like that. And, and he opened his eyes, and his commanding officer stood in front of him, and Tommy just went, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the week, um, the end of the week, um, he said, are you going to stay for a drink? Um, and I went, yeah, good. And he was notorious for, you know, sitting in a, in a, a bar um, at the end of the show until six o'clock in the morning. Right. You know, I mean, he, he liked to drink Tommy. And I, I think I gave up at three and he went, don't get too funny. But I remember, <laughs> I remember that night that um, kind of, uh, it got to about three o'clock and he was like, the bar's closed because there was a grill. You know the grills they bring down? And, um, and he was like, I can't get another drink. And there was this doorman called Arthur. He said, don't worry about that, Tommy, I'll sort it. And um, he brought out uh, a, a, a bamboo pole, a long bamboo pole with like a little hook on the end. He said, what do you want, Tommy? He said, our scotch. He went, right, it's, uh, seven o'clock, seven across, three up. And he put this bamboo <laughs> through, through the grill 
to the optic at the back, up like that, <laughs> and the drink came down to the bottom. <laughs> And that was, you know, for the rest, for the rest of the night. And the, I think my, I, I want this story to be so true. Um, he came home uh, to his house one night with Dennis Kirkland, his producer um, of the Tommy Cooper show that he did at the Thames. And um, if he came home on his own, his wife Dawn would say, uh, not Dawn, his wife Dove would say, get to bed, you're not drinking on your own all night. If he came home with a mate, she wouldn't mind him sitting up and having a drink. So he comes home one night and says, uh, Dove, I'm home, shouted up. She went, hello, Tom. I brought Dennis back for a drink. She went, hello, Dennis. And Dennis went, hello, uh, Dove. Lovely show tonight. Tommy was brilliant. I was brilliant tonight. It said I was brilliant. That's great. Have a lovely drink. Thanks. Good night, Dove. Good night. Good night, Dove. So <laughs> Dennis and Tommy then sit there, and um, Tommy's like, what do you have to drink, Dennis? He says, I'll have what you're having, Tommy. He says, I'm going to have a scotch. He said, well, I'll have the same as you. A large one? Large one. So they sit there and they're talking about the show. Great show. It was a great show. You were great tonight, Tommy. Fantastic. And the more they drank, the more the voices merged. <laughs> I thought you were absolutely fantastic. You were. You were so good. You were the best I'd ever seen. He'd come home on his own. And he wants to drink. <laughs> so he played the two parts like he used to do with those hats. Yeah, yeah. That. And so Dove went, get up to bed, you lying <laughs> bastard. So... <laughs> and then I worked with him on the, on the night that he died. I, uh, we, yes, that's right. Yes, yeah. I did know that. Yeah. Uh, myself and Dustin were the, were the next act on oh, after Tommy. And we'd been at the rehearsals all that day and... You know, Tommy had done, you know, so many, been funny and never done the same thing twice. Um, and um, I remember he had this, um, the, the end of his act was that he, w um, he had the tabs in uh, and it was one of those shows where it was all glitzy um, light bulbs, but he had the tabs in because he, he was doing this routine, um, like the big red curtains here behind us. And um, he, he put on a cloak and he was pulling thing, things out of a cloak, like, you know, magic, but clearly, yeah. the, you know, they started small, you know, lampshade, and then a coffee table, and then stepladders, and all sorts, but clearly they're being fed through yeah. from the, but which is just Tommy and funny. Um, and, you know, he just got the cloak on, and um, he collapsed to uh, the floor, and we were in the wings, we stood in the wings, just over there like that, looking, and uh, David Bell, the producer, is there, and he turns to uh, Tommy Jr., Tommy's son, and said, is that a joke? And uh, he said, no, my dad's got a bad back, he'd never be able to get up again. And, because the audience are laughing, because, I mean, yeah. you know, he was a funny man, he got, even was getting laughs in, you know, his dying moments. Um, and we didn't know, you know, and so, David Bell just coolly went, cue commercial, cue uh, music, cue commercial break. And the music played, and then uh, Jimmy Tarbuck and David Bell were on stage chatting about it. And we thought, well, that's it. They'll just pull the show and put something on. Because behind here, they've moved in behind the curtains, and, you know, the paramedics are racing on to, you know, check, you know, what's happening. And they wouldn't move him until, well, they wouldn't move him until the paramedics had got there. Um, so then they turned to us and said, you ready to go on? And we're like, what? And, you know, the commercial break ended and we came on and did our act in front of that, those curtains, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of. And you, you, uh, you're nervous before about the idea that you've got to go and follow Tommy Cooper. But when something like that happens, the nerves go and you just know that you're, hold, you're having to hold the fort you yeah, know, and yeah. carry on. It was, it was an extraordinary moment really yeah well you know? i mean you've, you've had these moments you, yeah. you've worked you've worked you know after your parents have died you yeah. worked those nights you worked yeah. that you carried on well dustin dustin, died dustin said pantomime. that night he said you know that's the way i'd like to go dustin said you know with yeah. my boots on and two years later be careful what you wish for because two years later he collapsed in a dressing room as we're doing panto and uh was then in a coma for two days and died on the third of January 1986. Yeah. You know? And uh, just, I miss him to this day, you know? He's, he, was, he was a funny, funny man, you know? Just, a, just a, a lovely, funny man. And, you know, a great company. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, we we actually met this year at the Stan and Ollie. We saw a little yeah. preview of Stan and Ollie, and you yeah. came out and said, "Oh, double act." Very... Well, because we both yeah. had that double act. I mean, no, experience. I wish my double act partner had died, but that's a different. <laughs> <moment. laughs> I envy you so much, Les. But, um... <laughs> There's always. No, time. I'd like him to live, but in, you know, some discomfort and pain. So, so it's, it's, that's. Um, <laughs> but that, but that, know, that movie was, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, I think echoes of that. Yeah, of that, course. That, it's like a marriage, yeah. isn't it? You yeah. know? And I remember, you know, that summer with Dustin, he, we had, um, which was, uh, it, it was in Panto that he collapsed and died. But that summer before in Blackpool, on the opening night of the show, we were, it was, the show was rocking. We were topping the bill. We'd got what we wanted. We were topping the bill at a big summer season for 20 weeks, twice nightly, yeah. you know, and the house was full. Um, and this was the opening night. And the, the first half of the show went so well. And then he went, I don't feel well. I don't feel well. They got a doctor in. And the doctor said, you've had a mild heart attack. And he, you've got to go to the hospital now. And he went, no, I'm finishing the show. And, you know, again, Laurel and Hardy. Um, yeah, he, he went on in the second half, was brilliant. The show uh, finished. They got an ambulance, took him to hospital down the pier. And I had to go and talk to all the dignitaries and, you know, oh, Dustin's, you know, he's just had to go off. And then I had to hold the fort for three weeks. And he didn't like it. Again, that yeah. echo of, you know, in that movie, see this movie, Stan and Ollie, it's fantastic. <laughs> but, um, you know, that kind of idea of like, ooh, somebody can work on their own without me. And, yeah. you know, and for, for when he came back, there was, we had a little spat and I remember one night going on stage and, and we weren't talking, we were doing the act, but we weren't talking to each other, <laughs> yeah. you know, off stage. And that, and I remember thinking, if this was to carry on, I couldn't do this. But we got over it, and yeah, you know, yeah. it was just one of those things. Well, it's a weird thing, you know. That is, me and Stu had a fight one day over something, you know, tri trivial. But we were going to do a gig that night, and right. you, then you come on stage and you, you know, you're not talking to each yeah. other on stage, yeah. Yeah. and you come on stage and you just do it all. And I think I sort of came off and said, oh, you know, we've had one fight in ten years, it's fine. Yeah. And that was it. And then it was that yeah. was it was it's all over. So it it's is the that, strangest feeling. It is. Though, it's it? a weird thing, and it is that competitive. You're sort of competitive mm. by it's, yeah. I mean, there's some there's weird double acts where they seem to always get on. Mm. I mean, it, and and then but then I think for it's just a, it's a stressful situation, yeah. obviously, and 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 I think yeah. you need that you need some kind of difference and spark between you yeah. to to make it to work. To make that work. And so it is. Yeah. I so felt very sorry for Paul Chuckle just recently because you know yeah, cause yeah. a brother as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. As your lifelong partner. No, it's in insane. Uh, well, and then you know, but also his whole career has been yeah. that act. Yeah. So I mean. If, if it, you know, it, it was a relatively a shorter time that you and Dustin worked Yeah, together. and we'd both been so, solo acts before. Exactly. But, you know, so you, when, when because we came into the public's consciousness as that double act, when, and, and Ernie, what, uh, Eric Morecambe had just what died, and, yeah. and Eric was, you know, kind of like, again, had been part of a double act for all those years. I think I, I find it very hard that going on stage there was a sense of will he be able to will he be able to yes, cope course, will he be able to course. cope and that it took a while for I remember you know I, I opened my act with I'm still standing I'm okay don't <laughs> worry so and then and then Family Fortunes came along which was an absolute gift yeah yeah, yeah. yeah you were all trying to do I, I, I bet you've been waiting to do it because everybody gets <laughs> everybody gets game show Tourette's around me and, and feels they have to do it. our survey said <laughs> That bloody noise follows me everywhere. <laughs> can't, can't go around a supermarket with it. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're the first ones to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that, that was, was, that was you a know, good again, but you followed, like, you know, and you sort of forget. You followed Max Bygraves and uh, um, Bob Monkhouse. Bob Monkhouse, Bob Monkhouse yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I think you're still the one that most people would associate with that show. I was very lucky, though, because, you know, my blueprint was to watch lots of Bob tapes. I, you know, I thought, I've got to do what Bob does. Max was, was different. You know, You've won a prize. <laughs> yeah, big money. There were apparently there were 200 edits in one show. Because he kind of, it's, it wasn't his bag. It wasn't no. what he did. And, you know, and um, Bob was the master of yeah. that kind of show. And I remember watching it and thinking, right, I've got to have a joke for every single member of both families. And that's not me either. And so the first series, you know, I think the first week I had a white suit. And, 
looking back on those, some of those suits. Some... <laughs> <laughs> There's some great ones in the after <laughs> show as well. Yellow, <laughs> yellow you're wearing in the after show. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the, the, that first series, and we did 26 shows in two weeks, so you don't get time to to kind of learn, and I was doing joke, 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 joke. And it only took me until, you know, you get a stupid answer. Name, you know, um, uh, name an occupation that requires a torch, a burglar. You know, and <laughs> name somewhere you might stand in a queue at the front. And... <laughs> Name something that's pink, my cardigan. Yeah, <laughs> it is, isn't it? Let's see if a hundred people agreed with you on that one. It's when you get the, the, those and suddenly you realise that, you know, just uh, playing off that, you know, and in looking down the camera and, you know, and I, one day I said, you know, if it's up there, I'll give you the money myself. And it got a laugh. And then the producer said, you should use that as a catchphrase. I said, I can't do that. I can't say that every time. He said, that's a catchphrase. <laughs> oh, yeah, OK. So, so I, I got a catchphrase. Yeah. And, and I realised that, you know, that was how the show worked. But, you know, it was a, it was a great show to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. 16 years I did of it. It's yeah. incredible, isn't it? Saturday night telly, they, Are know? they showing that still? Is that, is it's that still, still on Challenge, challenge? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I was sort of obsessed with watching... All of those kind of... They were repeating all the 70s and 80s yeah. game shows. Bullseye, yeah. I would Bullseye. just watch. Yeah. I'd watch them. We'd be the Edinburgh Fringe and I'd, there'd be all the entertainment <laughs> in the world on yeah. offer and I'd be watching back-to-back -back Bullseye <laughs> on Challenge TV in my dressing gown. <laughs> well, Jim was, came it, up. Didn't Jim come up yeah, to Edinburgh and yeah. do, do a one-man show about, about it? Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Quite, you know, quite a few of the guys have, have come up and done... I mean, obviously, you've, 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 you've never, have you ever done, like, a show about you or have you, you've just done acting in Edinburgh? No, it's funny. Um, the only the three that I've done in Edinburgh have all been plays, but I really would like, like to maybe do, like, a little retrospective thing yeah. and just, you know, I'd talk about me. But, I mean, because <laughs> for a while um, I was, you know, the, for, after I went into the Big Brother house, not my biggest um, uh, <laughs> good decision, but um, I came second. But... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I was labelled as Les Miserables for a yeah. while, you know, and that, that became, you know, the, the stuff I had to cope with. But when I was in there, you know, just touching... I know you're probably going to ask me about Big Brother. Go on, do you want to ask me about no, Big Brother? No, I don't. I, I, well, when I was in there... And, you, and let I mean, me ask about Brother. OK. What, what happened to Big Brother? <laughs> well, I thought it would be funny to talk to the chickens, you see, but I thought it was a bit of comedy shtick. But I didn't know that they were summoning the psychologist to <laughs> Les is in trouble. Um, and <laughs> I'd go out and sit and talk to the chickens and go, wait, wait. <laughs> and, uh, but then, like, for, for instance, you know, you, you, you're kind of at the mercy of the editing to some extent. And remember, this was the, the first one. They did one for Comic Relief, yeah. uh, for, um, uh, with the, the one that Vanessa was, was in and, and Jack D escaped. Yeah. And then we were the first celebrity one on Channel 4. But there were only six of us in there, and, there was, and it was only a 10-day um, uh, show. And, and we didn't, honestly, well, unless the others did, and I was just stupid, I didn't get paid. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a fee. You didn't go in for a fee. You supposedly went in for charity. But, of course, you're not going in for charity. You're going to give yourself a little kickstart, you know, and yeah. re reboot. Because um, the phone wasn't ringing. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it certainly wasn't ringing after, but because <laughs> <laughs> like Mark Owen was, you know, just you know he was saint-like and yeah. just lovely Saint Mark and and just fantastic and um, he won it and I came second. But I, what one um, afternoon he got his guitar out and sang the Verve song because the drugs don't work, you know. That and I and I'm very suggestible. If somebody you know sings a song, it's in my head all day. So, but when it went out on telly, um, they cut out Mark sitting, <laughs> singing with his guitar. And then at the end of the show, <laughs> as, as the titles are going across, there's me in the jacuzzi <laughs> going, cause the drugs don't work. They smoke you work. So, you know, I, but then I came second and he and I, I mean, Mark, Mark got through that whole experience by just tidying up. 
Right. You know, he loves to tidy up. He loves, loves uh, you know, making tea and tidying the kitchen and making it spotless. And when we were sat there, just me and him sat like this, and there was a bottle of champagne in an ice bucket, and um, Davina, we're waiting for t- Davina to come and talk to us and say who's won or who's going. Um, he said to me, he said, you're going to win. I said, no, no, Mark, you are definitely going to win. He said, no, I think it's you. He said, do me a favour. He said, if you win, if I win, um, when I go out, will you... Um, Put the bottle in the bin <laughs> and wash the ice bucket. <laughs> Look at him now. <laughs> yeah. So but yeah, it was a, you know you went through a, a difficult time. That I think yeah. everyone knows about, and it's. Yeah. Um, well, I couldn't walk down the road with the dog without you know they just wanted that photo of me looking. <laughs> You know, and yet, and you're trying to get your poo bag, and you know, but and they get that shot of well, it's a weird thing less. about well, it's a weird thing about the the showbiz and the papers. Yeah, and I think there was an element really where they could, you, know, you had a much younger, very attractive yeah. wife. Yeah, and I think there was this, this element where they want you know they were waiting for it to go wrong. They were waiting, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I think probably it's interesting when on on this is your life. You're yeah. you're there, and like a couple of people go, oh, it's going to be. It's going to be great. The marriage is going to be great. To the, in a way that, you, again, you wouldn't do to someone if yeah. you thought the marriage yeah. was going to no, be that's great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because you wouldn't need to yeah. say it. Um, and so everyone was waiting for it to go wrong. Yeah. And, but also, Nobody told me. But also... But, <laughs> but that element of... Uh, there was... I remember what, one day, um, kind of, uh, in, in our house in, in Highgate, and uh, it was the Grand National Day, and the plumber was there to fix a washing machine, and um, Amanda came running and said, um, we need to put a bet on. I went, what? It's the Grand National. I said, okay, great. And I, 10 quid, and she went, oh, we need to put more than that. And I went, 20? And uh, the plumber went, kids, eh? <laughs> Maybe I should have known then. <laughs> but you know what? It's kind of like we were together for ten years. Yes, People yeah. forget that. It was yeah. ten years, you know. And uh, but I think that's you know the, uh, marriages go wrong in showbiz all yeah. the time, and you know I think people were just were they wanted it to go wrong so that they could go see it's gone yeah. wrong, and they yeah. want you know, and then you have to be put through that, and that's yeah. it's your real life and your personal life, and you're yeah. obviously living it a bit in the Piers spotlight. Morgan <laughs> on the the Daily Mir- the Sunday Mirror <laughs> the last day before I came out of the um, Big Brother house had a picture of me sitting like this um, on, the, on uh, there was a bench where he talked to the chickens. <laughs> so there's me on a bench sitting like that and the headline, or rather the only, the whole page headline is, is this the most pathetic man in Britain? Right. So, you know, on, you, I kind of felt like I'd murdered somebody for a while because, yeah. you know, once we, once th- that all happened, or, you know, and there was stuff before that, I would have uh, journalists outside my house from six o'clock in the morning, like six cars outside the house on a double yellow line. Nobody stopped them, nobody moved them, but they were there in cars waiting. You know, I was in Chicago at the moment, at that time, playing a cuckolded husband. (laughs) (laughs) Art and life. Um, So, so, um, and I would come out of the front door and run to get into my mate's car and, and, Photographers were bouncing off the, off the the front of the car, you know, and kind of like I thought when I'd have to go out and then get in the car, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'd be chased, you know, by um, by car. I became the best getaway driver in London, <laughs> you know, because I because I could get away from the you know yeah. the press, but I had to had to do that, you know. But so it's very difficult to overcome something like that, and then it's all and everyone knows and, and yeah. everyone's following it. Yeah. And you know that's that's a again it's a it's a it's a testament to you. First of all, when people say Piers Morgan, people go, uh. <laughs> yeah. I think if we weren't if you weren't here and someone said Les Dennis, there would be a lovely reaction oh, from an audience. Do you know what I mean? Guy. So fuck yeah. fucking Piers Morgan, <laughs> who thinks he's who thinks he's popular, and, uh, you know. Thank you. Um, but well, you know, yeah. I mean, you know. Did um, you go on his show though? You went on his. No, I didn't. No, you, go, no, 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 no. I didn't. Often do that. that's happened where people yeah, have gone on the, yeah, yeah, the show no, and talked no, about no, his... life, life stories. No, yeah. no, I didn't. No. Oh, good. 
<laughs> but and, so, and I'll only go on a Thursday <laughs> on uh, Good Morning Britain. <laughs> yeah. Thursday or Friday. Oh, well, that's good. Because lovely um, Ben's there. Yes, he is. He was going to, he's going to be a guest on a future show as well. I don't, okay. think, don't yeah. think we'll have Piers Morgan on. My last interaction with Piers Morgan was uh, I tweeted a thing about him being a fascist enabling cunt. And he... <laughs> And I think I just retweeted it, I think, but he said, would you say that? You come and say that to my face. I said, I'll happily say it to your face. <laughs> yeah. well, he was just about to go to America, so... Okay. I might yeah. get him on just to call him a fascist <laughs> and come to his face and see what he does, because he seemed to be implying he would punch me in the face for doing that, which I okay. don't think would be... He might come on just to do that. Yeah, well, that'd be, it'd be good. Yeah. Good for the show. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't mind getting punched. But um, yeah, I, I kind of had to get through all that, yeah. and, you know, that's, that's what I did, and, and, you know, if I hadn't done Big Brother and all that stuff hadn't happened in my life, then Ricky Gervais wouldn't have called me yeah. and invited me on to Extras, yeah. where, you know, I was playing, as he called it, a twisted, demented version of myself. <laughs> yeah. Which was a, a pitch. <laughs> How would you like to come on and play a twisted, demented version of yourself? And uh, you'll, there's an arse shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I just thought, well, I'd, he referenced um, Larry Sanders and um, Curb Your Enthusiasm to my favourite shows, and he said, look, you'll be lampooning yourself. So I went absolutely with yeah. extras. And, you know, people, my friends were like, you know, are you, are you letting him, you know, are, are you sure it, you're not going to get kind of stitched up? And I went, I got the script and I read it, and I went, no, I'm not. And, you know, and Ricky always said that, like, um, you even added things. <laughs> <laughs> like, at, at the end, at the end of the, of the, the episode, because um, uh, there's, there's me and him sitting there, he goes like, what about there? And I said, I'm not going, and in the show he says, I'm not ending up with that pissed up slapper. And I ended up, you know, <laughs> at the end of the show, I'm in the dark in, and we're in bed. And, um, and it was written that I said to her, I don't really know. <laughs> and she goes, what? And I go, I don't really know, again. And I went, at rehearsals, I said, what if, instead of repeating, I don't really know, what if I say, if it's up there, I'll give you the money myself? <laughs> and he went, we're having that. <laughs> and in typical Ricky fashion, said, you're not getting a writing credit, but we're having it. So, you know, if I hadn't done that, then, you know, I know it was a chance for me to reinvent and smash that Les Miserables, you know, sure, sure. thing. But uh, when I was walking through Liverpool a few weeks after, this woman came up to me and she went, you all right now, lad? <laughs> and I went, yeah, what do you mean? She went, after that documentary about your life. <laughs> So she thought, you know, in, in a documentary, I was in a dressing room with Ricky Gervais telling myself while he's going, oh, what is that light switch about? What is that? <laughs> it was, a, you know, it was a gamble for you, though. And it, it was could, a gamble, you know, yeah. I think the stuff he's doing with all those things, yeah. it's all, it is treading a line and you're yeah. never quite sure I what saw, he himself I went, thinks I went to Afterlife, which yeah. is his new one, and it is amazing. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's as dark and as, you know, you, you watch it from behind the sofa rather than, you know, like, like all of his stuff, but it's hilarious and very moving. And, you know, this, uh, this idea that, you know, he plays a guy who has lost his wife and just thinks there's no point in living anymore. So he says what he feels. Yeah. He tells everybody what he feels. It's a, it, I think it's going to be... I've seen two episodes of six. Cool. It's Good. great. Yeah. It's, you know, it's... Um, I think what I like about your... What I like about your stuff is that, you know, when, when you did This Is Your Life, again, the, yeah. all the Coronation Street people yeah. W yeah. were on it and wanted Absolutely. to be part of it. And Mavis was... Yeah, joining yeah. in, saying, "I don't know if it's you or me doing this anymore." Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you know, you're you're prepared to be the butt of the joke, yeah. but you're but you're not. It's not any way right. cruel humor. You know? So people are flattered if Dennis you... Dennis Law was on my this yeah, is your yeah. life, which is because you know my family were a big uh, uh, Man United uh, family supporters, even though we're Scousers, and my dad played for Liverpool. But my mum was a big fan of you know the the whole um, kind of romanticism of of the Busby Babes and Munich and all that stuff. She became a Man United fan then. And she, in fact, came up with my stage name because my real name is Leslie Hesseltine. Um, and she suggested that Les Dennis was like Dennis Law backwards. So, you know, right. that was kind of that. So, so he came on and sadly my mum and dad weren't around to, to yeah. enjoy that moment. But, you know, yeah. Doddy came on. Which was, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, all these people. Yeah. What I like, I was reading about you, you on uh, New Faces, which you did win. And, yeah. you, and you nearly got... 
120 points, but Tony yeah. Hatch docked you one point. Docked me one point, but and, uh, we're friends now. And Tony, Tony was, you know what? I, I don't, I didn't mind Tony doing that because Arthur Askey would give everybody ten yeah. and have nowhere to go. You know, because if he liked somebody particularly, he had nowhere to go. Sure. And Tony Hatch was like the Simon Callow of his yeah. day. Simon Callow? Ca Cowell. It's late. It's like, it's like, like Simon Callow. <laughs> <laughs> the Simon Cowell of his day. But yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was, you know. But I love the fact that, you know, I love it when two generations kind of clash. I love the fact that Arthur Askey was a judge on that program, yeah. I didn't realise. Yeah. When you think, the, 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 the idea that you and him could overlap, I mean, yeah. obviously you did, but it's... Well, you know, you know not that... only on that, I then did his radio show at the Paris studios. Right. And, and I was on with uh, Arthur Askey and Sandy Powell. Right. So, you know, and Max Wall I've worked with, and I just mentioned Doddy became yeah. a friend, you know, and, you know, he always used to call me young juvenile. Um, <laughs> and he gave me tax advice once. <laughs> <laughs> No, honestly, he did. He said, I was saying about staying in Diggs. He said, don't stay in Diggs. Stay in a nice hotel. You can afford it. It comes off your tax. So, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the story that... No, Donnie... if you don't pay it, though, it doesn't... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the story that Donnie told me that I, you know, love... Um, we were literally... It was the 2008 um, uh, celebrations in Liverpool for Capital of Culture. And we were standing ready to go out and, you know... and where loads of people from Liverpool were going out and standing on the steps of, of uh, St. George's Hall. And uh, he said to me, he said, I, I had a hernia, you know, young juvenile. Um, and everybody was upset because they thought I was, I was in hospital. But the, I, I was there in the, um, on the operating theatre and, and the surgeon said to the anaesthetist, he said, um, give him a bit more. He said, I can't give him any more. He said, well, give, give him a bit more. He said, all right, give him a bit more. He said, a bit more. He said, I can't give him any more. He said, you can Five hours in the theatre. Let's see how he fucking likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love that he did that about himself. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know. But that's, you know, it's being able to laugh at yourself. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I don't know, I love this reinvention and, uh, and, and chop, you know, and, and riding the waves and, yeah. and getting over the storms. And, and now what you're doing is, I mean, it's sort of beautiful now, the, the, the life story, again, looking, looking back. Yeah. Because I think the stuff you're doing now, as a result of that, of, of, of doing extras, maybe partly, but you're yeah. always doing a bit of acting. But you've, yeah. you're sort of now like you're working at the RSC now. Yes, not the RAC, <laughs> the RSC. <laughs> Which I mean, when I got this opportunity this year, and, and you know, I have the most amazing family support from my wife Claire and my kids. You know, um, got a grown-up son Philip, um, and I've got two little ones now. I'm kind of. Uh, I remember when um, uh, when Eleanor was born, Barry, Barry Cryer saying to me, he said, 55 is a good age to be a, a new dad because you're up three times a night anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I, I have this amazing support, so I'm able to go and do these things. You know, like, you know, this is my first summer season since I did that Blackpool summer right. season, but this is quite a different summer season. I'm at the, the, uh, the Swans Theatre with two plays... Uh, I'm in The Provoked Wife, which is um, a, a restoration comedy by Vambra, and I'm in a, 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 a restoration tragedy uh, by Thomas Otway called Venice Preserved, and that's a real kind of Leah-like um, tragic part for sure. me, which, which is, you know, when I was 17, I went with the school to Stratford, and I remember seeing this actor, Emrys James, play oh, yeah. Feste, and just being blown away by the power and going, oh, and I've started doing the clubs that maybe I should go to grammar school, maybe I should go down this route. And I didn't, and I always wanted to get back to it. And so, you know, again, I was fortunate with Family Fortunes that we did three shows in a week. So I was able to then go off and go and do a, a rep play, you know, for uh, Equity Minimum, yeah. you know, and earn my stripes as an actor. So for me to be at the RSC now is just, it's, it's just one of those i'd say bucket list it is a bucket list but it's you know it's it's a life fulfillment really it's it's something that's come and and i'm so excited about yeah you know? no so that's the, that's going to be over the summer right through the summer we st we open in may and we play in rep with the two plays so you know one one afternoon you might come and see you know the restoration comedy um which is uh, a, a wonderful uh comedy by Vambera, who was an architect who built um, Castle Howard, uh, Castle, is it Castle Howard? The, the house in, Castle Howard, <laughs> Castle Howard in, um, where, the, where they filmed uh, Brideshead Revisited, you know, so he, architect and uh, Royal Naval College uh, 
uh, yeah, you yeah, know, right, Greenwich, yeah. you know, uh, worked on that and wrote plays. He was right. a slacker, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so uh, you know, it's just amazing and, you know, working with amazing actors. Yeah. You know? And if there's, well, there's, I mean, there's so much to talk about which we were not going to get round to, but you've, d you've done this great uh, play written by my mate uh, Danny Robbins, uh, yeah. End of the Pier, yeah. which is a, it's sort of what we've been talking about. It's about that. Yeah. The generations of comedy. It was, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I sort of think I think it's interesting because I think the seventies hit the eighties, and and there were some casualties yeah. amongst yeah. the comedians, and some got over the fences. If it's yeah. the Grand National, yeah. and yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think we're sort of hitting that again a little bit now. I think yeah. there's, I think there's again changes in taste that yes, some people absolutely. aren't going to be able to adapt to, and some yeah. people um, don't want to adapt to. No. No. I mean, no, Bernard Manning kept working until the end, didn't he? And he was, he did, he, you know, and, he's, and, yeah. and for a long time, he yeah. did for a long yeah. time. And if he hadn't uh, so. done the stuff he'd done, you'd say he was a brilliant comedian because yeah. he was a great, you know, his timing and his ability. Yeah. Of, uh, he was a funny man, but it just was, you know, questionable what he talked about. Yeah. But it's, so the play is about that. It's about the, a, a, yeah. a, a father and son. Are uh, you going to be doing this, this again, this play? We're hoping yeah. to, yeah. It, it, was, it was one of those um, shows that kind of crept up on, on the audience there because uh, we, it was the three Ws. It was the World Cup and it was Wimbledon and it was the weather. We had that amazing weather. And this play went in and um, after... It was a five-week run. Um, after the first two weeks was slow, but then you know the reviews came in and they were good. And then the last three weeks, you couldn't. You, we were selling standing seat uh, tickets. Yeah. And what I got a kick out of was that lots of comics came to see it. You know, and 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 the the comics that I love now. You yeah. know, um, so that that was great. You know. And it, it is. It was. It was based on this old comic who was part of a double act who had made a mistake in a in a club and had been seen by a Guardian journalist. They they're making this mistake, and his career went down the pan. His son comes to visit him um, and has maybe made a mistake um, that has been caught on Twitter. Right. Yeah. So it's all about that Twitter storm. It's about you know the kind of. Um, comedy then and now but also ab ab about the world of politics and, and, and race and everything it's a yeah. really smart and clever play by Danny Robbins you yeah. know just loved it and Blake Harrison um, played uh, my son Tyler Gavaya played his girlfriend and there were only four of us in it and Knitting Ganatra yeah. was <laughs> Knitting Ganatra who um, you know people would know from EastEnders um, uh, it has never done stand up and he had to do a 10 minute stand up right. every night and was amazing yeah. you know it was really great yeah oh, good well i hope we'll get to see that again yeah. i was i didn't watch coronation street and i know you're in coronation street for a couple of years yeah. um it sounds like a very interesting character uh, arc <laughs> i just want to discuss your character tried to burgle gail's house yeah yeah uh, then you married her yeah <laughs> Yeah, and then you split up after she lied to you. Yeah, about Though my was... about my son who wasn't my son. Okay. Um, yeah, and and I mean, then... does, does the bur the attempted burglary wasn't? <laughs> there, you got you got over that hump in the relationship. Yeah, yeah I, I did, but you know, kind of, I remember on the on the uh, first day, kind of like um, somebody hadn't informed the vision mixer that I was playing this burg. At this, that time, he was just the burglar. He wasn't Michael yet. Um, so, you know, and I turned up at the window and she went, that's less <laughs> <laughs> and, and people, again, on social media were saying, why, when Gail is going through, you know, the identikits of, <laughs> of this burglar, why, is, why didn't she just say to him, he looks like less <laughs> dead? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm married... Yeah, Gail, right, and, Gail, you know, I, I was husband number. I wasn't. Well, people think I'm husband number six. I'm hu husband number five. But um, you know, uh, she married Brian Tilsley twice. So um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Gail warnings, weren't there? You know, I mean, kind of <laughs> literally, you know, uh, she, uh, uh, does does Rose Kennedy have a black dress? You could ab apply that to uh, Gail Tilsley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that that um, whole idea of you know this this woman who's um, unlucky in love, and I was number six, and I yeah. was. And but then, don't marry a burglar. That's my advice. Well, to, you know, don't marry someone who's burgling you. Oh, you'll do. You get yeah. handy. You're here. 
But then I got killed, or did I get killed? I got allowed to die by... Does every, everybody know? I mean, Spoilers, anybody... man, come on. I'm no, not no, after that episode yet. It's not a spoiler, because he's gone as well. <laughs> by Phelan, the, 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 the baddie in it. Anybody know Phelan, the baddie in Corrie? Yeah. Two of you. <laughs> it was my, my people don't watch Corrie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, um, but that, that, um, the guy who played Phil and Connor, um, uh, we got reinvented as, um, in, in a, a gender change as Ugly Sisters in Panto. <laughs> we, we did Felina and Michaela <laughs> last year in Manchester. So. Uh, terrific. And yeah. it's, well, again, it's this full circle thing. Well, yeah. Doing, doing yeah. all your Coronation Street impressions yeah, yeah, and then exactly. being on Coronation and then being Street. In it, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it, you yeah. know, it, but that's what it's, yeah. I think if Whose anyone. Whose dream am I in? I don't know. <laughs> but it's an amazing it's 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 wonderful that um you know like i say i think i think the longer i do this if we can call this a job yeah uh, all of my career uh you know it's just still being there is the, is is an achievement for anyone who kind yeah. of manages to stay there so to stay there and be reinventing yourself and doing different stuff and being able to you know be able to do family fortunes and the rsc yeah there's not many people who could achieve no, that no that's not so and, uh, but Funnily enough, um, in The Provoked Wife, Caroline Quentin and myself are in it. So Ca Car Caroline started as uh, a, a dancer on the end of the pier right. with Bernie Clifton. Wow. So we've been kind of both... You know, I thought you were going to say, in The Provoked Wife, they're no, playing Family <laughs> Fortunes. <laughs> no, yeah. Funny enough, yeah. Caroline Quentin plays the host of Family yeah. Fortunes. In the, I think over a very long time. Yeah. Um, look, it's been absolutely marvellous to have lovely. you here. Um, thanks great. so much Thank for coming you. on. And... Uh, d uh, I'm sure there's another 20 or 30 years in you yet. Who knows yeah, what will come up who next? Knows? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Unbelievably. I mean, you're still, you're still in my, my mind, you're still like 25 and you still look like you could be 25. <laughs> oh, you. Uh, but you're not. No, I'm not. No, uh, but uh, <laughs> so, don't forget it. 66 this year, so, no. you know, it's coming up. Yeah, it's getting there. Both. Sorry to end on a downer there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the 66 year old Les Dennis. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>